오늘 우리에게 주시는 하나님의 말씀은 The message comes from Acts chapter 12 verse 1 to 19. Let's do a response reading. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people were gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. Amen. Now let's all pray together for the overseer who is preaching and for your own souls. Pray that the Holy Spirit will inspire and touch us. Let's earnestly cry out Jesus once and pray. God our Father, as you have commanded us this Holy Lord's Day, we have come before you, God, with thanksgiving, and we give you all the glory. We serve you, Father, and give you glory, Father. No, let us be humble before our God, the Father, and revere him in this hour. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's sing him for 11. Yes, Sarah, she will 
부족하신 말일세 아멘. 우리들은 약하나 예수 권세 많더라 날 사랑하심 날 사랑하심 날 사랑하심 성경에 써있네 나를 사랑하시고 나의 죄를 다시서 하늘 문을 여시고 들어가게 하시네 날 사랑하시 날 사랑하시 날 사랑하시 성경에 써있네 내가 연약할수록 더욱 귀히 여기사 높은 보좌 위에서 낮은 나를 보시네 날 사랑하심 날 사랑하심 날 사랑하심 성경에 써있네 세상 사는 동안에 나와 함께 하시고 세상 떠나가는 날 천국 가게 하소서 날 사랑하시 날 사랑하시 날 사랑하심 성경에 써있네 아멘 교회의 합심 기도 The church praying in one accord Let's all read the sermon outline together God is love the reason He sent His Son to the world was that He loves the world. However, the people of this world were doomed to perish as a result of sin. Thus, He carried the cross to save them. God also revealed His name to mankind in order that they may bow their knees before the name Jesus and go before God. Whoever receives the name Jesus is given the privilege as a child of God and is able to ask God for anything at any time in Jesus' name. Though there are many spirits in this world, they are not God, and hence they cannot save mankind. Only Jesus, who is the Word incarnate and truth, is the true God who will save His people. The Church ought to rely on God by praying fervently. Our God is our Saviour. The Church must not lose faith but rely on Jesus' name, for then God is glorified. Those that believe in Jesus, who is God, experience supernatural phenomena even now. True faith is to believe this. The whole church must be devoted in prayer together, while pastors, with patience and a heart of martyr, must pray and pray in one accord. Amen. God is love. We always hear the word, and we also see in the Bible that God is love. And yet we forget about it easily. Even little children do not consider their mums as those who just feed them. When they go to their mum, they know that they can have a good rest and they have a peace of mind. Children know that their mum love them and that their mom can do everything for them. So the children don't think about how old their mom is or how their mom looks like. 
they know that their mom is someone that they can rely on, that they can depend on, and that they are loved by mom. It's love. Love is to love to the end. Love is about loving to the end. So in John chapter 13, Jesus loved his disciples to the end. He, sh he showed them the full extent of his love. It says, but the devil had already prompted Judas' mind. He already prompted Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. God loved him and showed him the full extent of his love, loved him to the end. As we raise children, we want them all to be great and outstanding people. But then there are children that still don't listen to their parents. And that makes you angry, that makes you cranky. Some moms even say they want to... Uh, just hit their child because they just won't listen. And some fathers say, you know, you're not even part of our family anymore. From today, you are not my son anymore. But even if he says that at one moment, when another person comes and says anything about his son, he would say, well, why are you talking about my son this way? Even though he wasn't happy with his son, when other people slander against his son, he would defend his son instead. And even between teacher and disciple, it's like father and son relationship. So teacher and uh, student relationship is very similar to father and son relationship. There is something that I feel a lot these days. Young, these young men, and even, and some of them, I've seen them from very young age. I blessed them, I loved them, and when they became young people, youths, I made sure that they were nurtured in faith, and and I gave them scholarship all to go to school and university. Even about a hundred or so of our pastors, even the pastors of our denomination, they received that benefit. They were they learned and they all studied at the seminary by receiving scholarship, and they also went through the lay uh, as worked as lay ministers, and then they were ordained as pastors to become pastors. It is very difficult to build one worship, regional worship center and to look after the same step, but we built worship centers in many different places and gave them workplaces so that they can work so that those pastors can work. I was hoping to build about 200 uh, worship centers and allow about 200 disciples to take care of one each and I believe that they can all work well until the coming of the Lord. Of course, if they are filled with the Holy Spirit and if they have faith and if they are humble before the Lord, they could do this work. And that's what I was hoping for. But we have this, these troubles going on today. And it's, it hurts me. In a small church, if you have one or two people that cause you trouble, it's a lot of anguish for the pastor. But this... What we are going through right now is a huge storm raging against us. And it's, it really pains me. But what I think about these days is if they deny Berea, what happened? What would happen if they deny Berea? 
That means they will deny the picture of God's will. Then for the next few months, they, they might be able to preach sermons depending on their morals and ethics, but after that, how will they preach? Once they go out, once they step out of this, it will be hard for them to preach. No matter how I think about it, it was un until now, it was by prayer, that is, back to the Word, back to the Word, by knowing the picture of God's will. They had preached sermons, but once they deny this, how can they preach any longer? That's my concern. So no matter how much they might hate me or no matter how much uh, they are angry, they shouldn't uh, deny or give up Berea. This concern is in, this is a concern I have. It's a pity even if they go out and plant their own church, they have given up on this power that they have been given. So how can they continue? And sometimes I can't even go to sleep thinking about this. They have already denied me. They have already criticized me. They have turned their backs against me. But still, in my heart, I have this heart of a father that I, I'm concerned about them I think about their faces as well and they used to be very humble they used to be very gentle they were very zealous they were outstanding what a pity this is what comes to mind this is the father's heart the father's heart loves his son and loves even to the end. Even though the father says out of anger, get out. When the son is out and doesn't come back home, the father will be standing at the door waiting for his son to come home and he wouldn't be able to sleep at night. That's the father's heart. So Jesus loved us and he loved us to the end. He loves us to the end. So even to Judas Iscariot, he said, it would have been better if he was not born at all. It's a pity. Because he was his disciple. It is out of pity that he says, it would have been better if he was not born at all. Then he wouldn't have gone through this. He would not be in this state. That is the love of God. To love God to the end. To love it to the end. When I was in elementary school, although uh, we were all in the same class, there are some who are the first out of their siblings, and I am the fifth out of all my siblings. So when you look at uh, the mothers, my friends' mothers, they were all in the early 30s, they were beautiful and they were well dressed and, and they would come to the school oval. But when I saw my mother, she was old and she was uneducated and her face was always dark, sunburnt. So when I compare her to my friend's mothers, she was very different. But I never thought of my mom as being ugly or bad looking. Whenever I run up to her, she would hug me and if I sit on her lap, I would just fall asleep. It was my resting place. And I was loved by her. So there is no person who would consider, oh, my mother is pretty or not. They just know she is my mother. She is my mother who loves me. And in this way, love does not need any other conditions. It doesn't require any other conditions. That's why love is called agape. Agape means it's unconditional. There is just love. 
No other conditions there is. Just love. There is no other requirements, no other conditions. It's just love, unconditional love. God loved us and He loves us to the end. I hope you would have boldness in your faith life. I want to say this because I want you to have boldness in your faith life. Even I am bold and you need to be bold. When we come to lead our faith life, when we are drinking water, is that cup made out of pottery? Is it made out of wood? Who thinks about what you use to drink the cup? It's the water that you drink that's important. We are not trying to eat the cup itself, are we? Because the pastor, just say that the pastor is an object of hatred. Just say that he's like a clay jar that is that is unworthy. In the mountains, if you go to the mountains, you can just take off a bark of a tree and use that to drink water. Now, I am just like a vessel, a cup that you use to drink water from. Don't you come here to receive the word? What did it say? Jesus Christ had no fall. He, oh, there was nothing about him that people shall admire him, that sh people shall desire him. There was nothing to desire about him. There was nothing special about him, in other words, in appearance. So, though he was in Nazareth for 30 years, there was nothing that made him stand out among the rest of the people. And in the Bible it said that he experienced hunger, he experienced pain, he was even naked. He went through a lot of things. But was it because of his appearance, was it because of what he had that the disciples followed him? The disciples said, you have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? Words of eternal life are with him because the words of eternal life come from him. It's not because of his appearance that they came to Jesus. It was not because of any other conditions that he had. It was because of the words of eternal life that came from his lips. So Jesus said, My words are spirit and they are life. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. My words are spirit and they are life. The words of eternal life are with you. To whom shall we go? The reason you come to church, it shouldn't be any other condition. It is. It should only be for the Word, for the Word. The Berea movement that we have been leading until now, Berea is, the name itself might be a bit unique, but it just means back to the Word, back to the Word, back to the Word. Let's go back to the Bible. Why? People keep trying to reform things, develop things, and that's why Christianity is turning into a religion, a religion of ethics and morals. However, we have to go back to God's Word. Christianity has wandered away from God, God's Word, like a lost son, like the prodigal son, and we are trying to bring then back to God's word. Jesus said, come to me, follow me. Even in John chapter 1, whenever he called his disciples, he said, follow me, follow me. And abide in my words, abide in my words, then you will be my true disciples. And so we have to go back. Even Jesus said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? Did you go out to see well-dressed men? What did you go out to see? Did you go to see well-dressed people? Then go to palaces. What is it that you have come out to see? 
여러분 신앙에 우리가 눈앞에 보이는 어떤 좋은 Our faith life is not about looking for some good conditions that we can see. We are seeking the word that could save us. That's why we need to go back to the word. Now I'm very old, but even in the next generation, our church has become there is no other church like our church that has been persecuted for the for half a century trying to go this one way without true calling and mission it's not possible but we have endured and we have persevered despite all the persecutions and hardships we have just come back to the word and this is this has to continue even in the next generation i have to you have to we all have to continue this movement going back to the word we shouldn't follow our desires what are our desires desires are the flesh's desires carnal desires we shouldn't seek reformation and development based on our sinful desires, carnal desires. We need to come out of that. So the Bible says, do not seek the wide and broad way, for that is the way to destruction. But come through the narrow way, come through the narrow gate, the way that people don't want to go, the way and the gate that is so hard and difficult. Come through the narrow gate, Jesus said. It is so difficult today to lead this back to the word movement. Even the people who have been advocating the movement for decades now have gone to another direction, trying to get rid of the name Songnak, trying to get rid of the name Berea, or get rid of Shimon who has been teaching this. But you need to understand the value of the faith you have. The love of God. So the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Who is the only begotten Son? He is the Word. The Word became flesh. He so loved the world that He gave His Word. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave us His Word. People say, oh, God so loved us, so He should give us money, He gave us a house. That's a conditional faith. We do not have conditional faith. We are not superstitious people. We are those who seek eternal life. We won't be able to live more than a hundred years on the earth. Once we leave this world, we will go into the Father's house. We will enter heaven and that's our absolute hope. If there is no heaven, He would not give us the Holy Spirit. But because there is heaven, Jesus ascended to heaven. And after He ascended to heaven, He asked the Father and sent out the Holy Spirit, just as He promised to do so. It is from heaven that He said, the Holy Spirit, if there is no heaven, the Holy Spirit will not come into us. The Holy Spirit does not come from the earth. The Holy Spirit is not a God of this world. He is a Spirit who comes down from heaven. Because there is heaven, there is Holy Spirit given us, and that's the proof that there is heaven. Jesus resurrected and ascended into heaven, and in heaven He asked the Father, and He promised to send us Holy Spirit, and He surely did send us Holy Spirit from heaven to be born again. The original meaning of to be born again means to be born of heaven, means to be born from above. You and I have received the Holy Spirit that came down from heaven, and we have been born again by the Holy Spirit. God so loved us that He gave us one and only Son. He gave us His Word. If you really receive God's love, then you should be filled with the word that God has given you. 
And the word should come inside you and lead you, take control of you. So the word should be at work inside you, should be moving inside you. So when the son gets a, gets a job in a good company, they say, oh yeah, God loves us. That is part of it, but God loved us and what He gave us because of His love is what? He gave us His only begotten Son. He gave us the Word. So in John chapter 1, verse 1, He was with God. He is God. The Word is the, the word is God who was with God. And the Word came to the earth. He came to His own people, but His own people didn't recognize Him. So whoever believes and receives His name have been given the right to become children of God. God gave us the word. That word is inside us. So even Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 7, If my words abide in you, then ask for whatever you wish. You have the right to ask, you have the privilege to ask, and then you'll receive it. When the word has come inside us, when the word has come inside us, it's the name of the word that came inside us. What is that name? It's Jesus. The name of the word. I ask you, what is the name of the word? Say it louder. What is the name of the word? It's Jesus. And we have to know this. The name of God's word is what? That's right. It's Jesus. It, th there is a saying that those who obey heaven will be blessed. But that is not something that we say in Christianity. It's not from Christianity. It's something that Confucianism has taught. We are not obeying heaven. We are serving and worshipping God and we obey Jesus. We obey the Holy Spirit. Now, he, the name of the word came inside us and that name is Jesus. The name Jesus was, was made known to the mother of Jesus when he was conceived. You will have a son. He will be, he is the son of God and his name will be Jesus. He will be called Jesus. It is a name given by God. So the name of the word is Jesus. So the word was conceived and, and grew up in the womb for 10 months like a human. In Hebrews it says, he became a man to taste death. Human life is it starts from being conceived until growing up and dying and being buried. Then that's what he came to taste. That's why he became a man. So God came to the earth and he started from the very first start of a human being. He experienced man's life from the womb. He grew up 10 months in the womb, and after he was born, he grew up in the world. He experienced that human life, and while he grew up, he experienced everything that humans go through. The Bible says that he experienced all the weaknesses of human beings. He even experienced, he knows all the diseases as well, it says. So he experienced that too. So he would have gone through chickenpox as well. 
He probably experienced the common cold. He experienced human life as it is. He also experienced poverty. He also experienced being uneducated. So he experienced the how the uneducated people were despised and looked down upon. So Jesus said in the Bible, when I was thirsty, you didn't give me water to drink. So he even experienced thirst, he experienced hunger, he experienced being naked. Because he said, when I was naked, you did not give me clothes to wear. So he experienced that. And finally, he was forced and blamed as a sinner. He was put a th crown of thorns on his head and he was spat upon, he was scourged. He experienced all of that. He was blamed falsely as a sinner and he died on the cross. He experienced death on the cross. He was treated like a criminal on the cross. He wasn't treated any better than those criminals, but he was despised and slandered and persecuted and suffered death on the cross and he was even buried in the tomb. He experienced human life. But his name is Jesus. Today, you and I have to listen carefully to know what Jesus' name is. Jesus is the Son of God. He received the name Jesus as an inheritance from God. He received God's name as an inheritance. So the Father's name, the name Jesus, he has. He has the name Jesus, but he was despised, he was persecuted, he was laughed at, sneered at, he experienced hunger. He ex was in the danger of death many times, he was falsely accused, and he was falsely accused, the sinner died on the cross. When we look at the life of Jesus, there is nothing to admire about it. Even the Bible says there is nothing to desire about him. It's only because we are Christians that we call on Jesus. But unbelievers, there is nothing for them to desire about Jesus. Because he was only persecuted. No matter how many kind good things he did, he was just persecuted, he was despised, he was disregarded, and in the end he was condemned the sinner. And he was hung on the cross for all people to see. The whole world saw that. Even though he had the name Jesus, he could not go beyond the life of a human. Today, you and I have the name Jesus. And what did it say? We have been given the right as children of God. Instead, in John chapter 1, verse 12, we have been given the right to become children of God. So we have the right to the authority, which is the same as that of the Son of God. We have the right as children of God. So this is so just as the Son of God has the name Jesus and he lived in this world for 33 years and experienced the life, as a, uh, the life of a human, as we lead our lives on the earth, we have the name Jesus. Because we have the name Jesus, of course, our character has been changed and so that we comfort one another even in our families we have gentleness we have these characteristics of Jesus which we are thankful for but just because we have the name Jesus doesn't mean that our other conditions living conditions have changed just because we believe in Jesus doesn't mean that we who were uh, a freshman in the company have suddenly become CEOs no, even if you don't believe in Jesus, if you get into a company after a while, you might be promoted to the next position. But there are many people who come to believe in Jesus thinking that their life conditions will be changed drastically. Though we believe in Jesus, we have to know that our life on the earth doesn't change. The conditions of our life don't change just because we believe in Jesus. So even though we have the name Jesus, we might be falsely accused and condemned. We might experience hardship. We might even experience loss and pain. 
we can get sick, we can become poor, we experience all those things. Then why do we need Jesus' name, people might ask. It's the son's authority. It's the authority to become the son of God. It's the authority to become the child of God. Jesus went through the human life for 33 years and he did not resent the fact that he had the name Jesus. He didn't resent the fact that he had the name Jesus given to him by the Father. Instead, in the Bible, Jesus said, Father, give them the name you have given me also so that they may be one as we are one. Just as the Father has the name Jesus, just as the Son has the name Jesus, just as the Holy Spirit has the name Jesus, the name Jesus, give them also so that they may be one as we are one. And what's the reason for that? This is so that this is not to take them out of this world, but that while they're in this world, they may be kept. It is to keep them in this world. Why do we have to have the name Jesus? If we have the name Jesus, we have the right to be children of God. Why does He want us to become His children? Why does He want us to have the name Jesus? So that while we are in this world, it is not to take us away from this world, but to keep us in this world, to keep our souls in this world. People say that they believe in Jesus' name, but they are not seeking to keep their souls in the name Jesus. Instead, they say, when they get money, they say hallelujah, but when they lose money, they say, oh, it's because we go to church. And they blame the fact that they go to church, the fact that they believe in Jesus as a reason why they are in hardship. Even though they have the name Jesus, they don't think about anything else, but when that they go to church, that they are leading a very good moral and ethic uh, life. And when their children don't get into a good university, they say, oh, it's useless going to church, it's useless to get prayers from a pastor. It's useless of giving a lot of thanksgiving. I thought God will bless us if I give him a lot of offering. So they are full of resentment. There is no other conditions, no other reasons to us believing in Jesus. The reason we believe in Jesus, the reason we have the name Jesus is so that our souls do not cor get corrupt. It's so that our souls do not perish while we are on the earth. This is the Lord's will. So Jesus said, out of those whom you have given me, Father, I will not lose any of them, for this is your will, Father. He doesn't want to lose anyone that the Father has given him, but preserve them, keep them. What is this based on? In the Bible, it says, this is to fulfill the scriptures, he said in what the Bible, what, it, what is the reason that the Bible is written? It is to preserve their souls, to keep their souls so that they do not fall into evil, so that they do not perish while they're in this world, even though they face tribulation, hardship, and ordeals, that they do not fall, but that their souls will be kept. The souls that have been saved by the blood be kept, kept until the end so that on the day of the Lord's return, that they may all, that those who have passed away early will go to paradise and that the rest will be taken up into heaven. And this is to fulfill the scriptures. So what is the purpose of the Bible? It is to take us in the end. What is the word of the Bible? It is to take us. So he gave us the name Jesus before we even read the Bible the scripture existed and he was to fulfill the scriptures that he gave us the name Jesus by relying on the name Jesus our souls have to be preserved according to the Lord's will no matter how poor we might become no matter how sick we might become no matter how much suffering we go through we have the name Jesus I have the name Jesus I am the child of God I have to write as a child of God and this 
is the faith and joy we must be filled with. It is by the name Jesus that we have to overcome the world. And the reason for this is to fulfill the scriptures. To fulfill the scriptures. You let the scriptures be fulfilled in your families. Let the scriptures be fulfilled in your life. Now, what did he say to those who have the name Jesus? Bow your knees before Jesus' name. And whatever it is, pray and ask for it in my name, whenever it is. Now, when they, when they hear this, people think, Oh, Father, God, give us this, give us that, give us everything in Jesus' name. As if they're sticking a stamp on their mail, they've just put Jesus' name at the end of their prayer, thinking that they will all be accepted by God. When we say pray in Jesus' name, it means if your soul is truly kept in Jesus' name, then rely on that name and pray. In other words, if you have truly become a child of God, then pray. Pray if you have become a child of God. I've been to many churches in the U.S. and there are not many churches that actually say in Jesus' name at the end of the prayer. Some people, some churches, they say, God, Father, we have come together and we are praying to you. We, there is something that we desire of Him. Amen. And, but for Koreans, they think there has to be in the name of Jesus for the prayer to end. But actually the prayer has ended with Amen. So Korean people think that in Jesus' name has, has to always be attached at the end of prayer, as if putting a stamp on your mail before sending it off. But in the U.S., half the churches don't say in Jesus' name at the end. They say, God bless us. Amen. When they pray for the meal, they say, God, thank you for giving us a good meal. Amen. Then some people ask, these people are heretics because they don't say in Jesus' name at the end of their prayer. We have already received Jesus' name. So we rely on that name we, and live by that name. We pray in that name. So we, so those who bow before that name, rely on that name and pray. And there is the power of that name, uh, the power of that prayer. Prayer is not meditation. Prayer is about challenging the impossible. Let's all say it together. Prayer is to challenge the impossible. Say it louder. Say it earnestly. Prayer is to challenge the impossible. It's to practice. It's practicing this challenging against the impossible. We are challenging against the impossible. In other words, it's about going beyond common knowledge, common sense. We pray for even things that are beyond our common sense. I have always given testimony that in, I say these testimonies so that it helps you to have faith. In regards to having built churches, like I say, we I have built 120 church, the church center buildings. Of course, I didn't go and do the commentary work myself. But when we were building the Christian World Mission Center, I went from the first floor to the 13th floor uh, morning till night. So I came to the center about 300 times, more than 300 times in the year that we were building this Christian World Mission Center. But when I say that I've, I built it, I'm not trying to boast that it was out of my money, that it was my, out of my ability that I did this. What I always say is, we have achieved this through prayer. From 1964, I was praying for 10,000 uh, leaders, and I was praying for a space where at least 10,000 people can be accommodated. And so I prayed 40 years for such a worship center. And in order to 
get money to buy land. I prayed. And I'm trying to tell you that it was all by prayer that we achieved this. What I did was pray, pray, pray. And all of this was fulfilled, was accomplished by God Himself. Even in the Bible it says, it is our duty to ask God, but the one who determines it, who fulfills it, is God. Man, my plan, but the fulfillment of it is with God, he said in the book of Proverbs. If he does not listen to our prayers, can all of this be possible? So it's because I have prayed that these things were done. That's what I'm trying to say. It is through a lot of prayer that this was possible. It's impossible for our church to actually achieve this. In order for this to be achieved, we need to be a... We need to have, uh, be a big church. We had a, we had to have nine worship services on the Lord's day, and it was through such revival and also through much prayer that this was achieved. Now, prayer is a faith of challenging the impossible. Even though you say you have faith, if you don't pray, it's useless. The Bible says the reason you don't receive is because you don't ask. It's because you don't ask. That's why you do not receive. Jesus wants to give us but if we don't ask him he will not forcefully give to us we have to ask him we have to ask him even though we became elders we have to ask God for the power to fulfill our duties as elders if you have become teachers you need to ask God to give you the power the ability to teach so we have to believe in the existence of angels. So in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, it says, Who are the angels? When we look at the work of the angels in the Old Testament, they are not myths, they are real. The angels are ministering spirits sent to serve the saints who are to receive salvation. Are you using those angels? Do you have angels that help your family? Are you using them? Are you making use of the angels? You have to. I believe. That. And so I use those angels. Now, when Peter was in prison, he was the overseer of the Church of Jerusalem. Now, he was in prison. He was in prison. And tomorrow, he was sentenced. He was to be uh, put to death and so he was uh, put in the put in prison with many guards and all the doors locked and he had chains on on his feet and his arms but his but the church came together and prayed all night. Peter was in prison, but the saints were earnestly praying for him. In verse 5 it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. They prayed earnestly to God. They prayed so hard because Herod announced that Peter would be put to death the next day. Did they pray for Peter's, for them to bring the dead body of Peter? No, they would have prayed for Peter to be brought out alive. Herod has said that he will kill Peter. Now, did they pray so that they can receive Peter's dead body tomorrow? They prayed to God to save him. They prayed to God to save him. They prayed earnestly. The whole church prayed. And that evening, there was a great miracle. There was a great sign of God. An angel appeared and struck him on the side and told him to get up, and all the chains fell off. Then the angel said, put on your clothes and said, follow me. And as he was following, all the gates opened and the guards were just sitting there. We don't know what happened to them. But the next day, 
The guards saw that the gates were locked, but Peter was gone. But Peter surely walked out those gates, and the angels told him to go and lift him. Then so Peter realized that the angel was sent by God to save him, and so he met the saints again. Dear saints, we are faced with such a similar reality right now. We need to pray. Our church needs to pray. And our, uh, oh, back to the word, Sangrak Berea Love Committee. Uh, our church members are all members of that committee. Now all of our ordained deacons, elders and pastors, those who have been ordained, you also need to come together and pray hard. You have to pray. We have to pray. Our church has to pray. We have to pray 10 times more than we used to. We have to pray 10 times harder and 10 times more. Such miraculous signs appear even today. You have to know that I gave this testimony and I've written in my book that I was crossing a river. Now, the water was only up to my knee and I crossed the river, but people behind me, who were right behind me, the water came up to their chest and they were not able to walk across. Now, I got on the bus and the bus driver said, how did you cross that river? And I looked back and the people who were with me were standing on the other side of the river. But how did I cross the river? The water only came up to my knee. I don't know how I crossed the river. But back then I prayed really hard because I was praying a lot for the tent revival. And I was about to meet the missionary from America. And I was praying very hard for that. I was praying and praying and praying and praying. Even on the, it was rainy that day. But I don't know how I crossed that river. And the water was only up to my knee when I crossed it. But the people who were walking with me to get on the same bus, the water came up to their chest and they couldn't cross the river. Why? Even now, this is a mystery. We have to believe this. We have to believe. We have to believe. That's why today we are able to have this big church. It's not with money that we achieved this. It was by God's answers to our prayers. We have to pray. Let's pray. Let's all pray. Pray for your families as well. But from now on, truly pray for the church even more. Our church members, you have to pray with a calling. I bless you all in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Pray. The church has to pray. Please stand. We have to pray. Prayer is the faith to challenge the impossible. Use your faith. Use your faith. Use your faith. Let's all pray earnestly. Lord, my God, Jesus, my God, Jesus, strengthen me. Give me power. In other words, send me angels. Angels are the hand of God, God's finger. God, give me power. God, send me the ministering spirits to help me. Let's all pray together.